Hello, welcome back to another Fire Drill podcast. This is Alan Shipnuck. Big day in the world of professional golf. The PGA Tour has announced some sweeping changes to the structure of the tour and, and what the elevated events are going to look like going forward. I am delighted to be joined by a, a gentleman who's been in the room where it happened, to quote Hamilton. Peter Malnati, one of the five uh, player directors who runs the PGA Tour, essentially. Peter, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me, Alan. I appreciate it. It's going to be a, it's going to be a tumultuous time here. So let, 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 let's put some truth out there. Exactly. So w- one of the criticisms of the tour in the past is that the player directors and, and the, the player advisory committee has, has skewed towards the best, most successful players who may not be fully in touch with uh, the membership as a whole. And so I think one of the reasons why you got elected to the board is you were going to represent the, the tour middle class, if you will, because the other directors are Rory McIlroy. We know who he is. Patrick Cantley, top 10 player in the world, U.S. Open champ, Webb Simpson, and Charlie Hoffman, who's won about $100 million in the PGA Tour, it feels like. And um, and so I think folks were thinking Peter Malnati is going to is going to he's going to be the man who's an obstructionist as as the, the Delaware, you know, 23 trying to reshape the tour. Um, but of course, um, it hasn't quite played out like that. And I know from our text messages today, you've had a, a change of heart in, in your thinking about, about the structure of things. Can, can you walk us through how, how your thinking has evolved and, and what you think of these new changes? Yeah, I mean, I definitely can. And, um, and I, I will be the first to admit, um, you know, I was, I was, I was disappointed with the the tour coming out of the, the Delaware meeting, you know, the, 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 the frame that the tour tried to put on that was look how invested our stars are. They, they're meeting. And, and to me and a lot of my peers, I think it felt like, well, I mean, the tour has a governance process and we're ignoring it. Like, you know, we're just, that, that this isn't leadership. This is, you know, blackmail. Like, 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 like I think there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of angst for sure. And, and, and I was at the very top of that. Like I, I was, I was, I was frustrated. I didn't think that was right. I felt annoyed. Sure. I do. I do really appreciate um, and did really appreciate that, you know, these guys want to be here playing on the PGA tour, but um, it, it felt to me like they didn't want to respect the, you know, the 40 or 50 years of, of process has gone into building the PGA tour. So as recently as um, as recently as last Wednesday, I, I was adamantly against the idea of the PJ Tour adding small field no cut events to its schedule. I just that that seems antithetical to me from the tour's mission of identifying and rewarding the best golfers in the world. I feel like you know just on a simple simple scale, it just seems less competitive to me to have to be. 69 other guys than it does to have to be at 119 other guys or 155 other guys for some of our full field events in the summer. So, so I was, I, I was just adamantly opposed. It felt to me like a way to put more money into the pockets of the top players directly, just, just to hand it to them. And that's, that's, that's how it felt. And, um, I was, you know, I was standing so strongly against that. Um, and, Last week we had a call. The we call ourselves the ops committee, but essentially it's the player directors um, on you know the the policy board. So none of the none of the independent directors, but just the players um, are the ops committee, and we talk about tournament operations. Um, and so obviously there's really only one real subject right now is you know what is our what does our product look like? What's our future model? Um, and so last Wednesday we we had a call to talk about this and kind of the tour the tour brass sort of. Um, you know, they, they proposed this model that they basically, the way this was kind of, the way this came to be, they set it up as, as kind of a, a dichot or not, a, I don't know, it was a trichotomy of thing. Three, three, three things. Um, there was essentially kind of coming out of the Delaware meeting. It seems like there was, you know, if, if, if the tour had just given that group of 23 players, everything they wanted, we would, we would essentially have, either a two tour system or just, you know, one elite PGA tour and then something else for the rest of us. Um, so that was definitely a two, a two tour system. So that was, you know, an option that was here at the top of the page, kind of at the bottom of the page was this idea of 
well, let's do nothing. Let's just keep keep moving forward with, you know, we got invitationals at 120 player fields. We've got, um, you know, our regular FedEx Cup events, um, you know, maybe throw $20 million in the purse at a few events where we can somehow sell that to sponsors, whatever, just just move forward with, without changing anything. And so this this new model, which is in the middle of those two, was proposed, and you know, the tour has kind of coined it the designated event model. Um, and, you know, it's been through many, many, many iterations. But I sat in this meeting last Wednesday, this ops committee meeting, and it's like, nope, hate it. Absolutely hate it. No, you know, more events, small field, no cut. You know, you're taking playing opportunities away from the members. It's just terrible. Um, but in the days after that meeting, some of the points that they made started to sink in a little bit as I, you know, your brain kind of, you go in with just this idea. And and as I let this, I let some of the stuff that they said sink in, there became these moments where I was like, gosh, like, because to me, like any good point that they made in that meeting was just, Oh, they're just saying that so they can give the top players what they want. They're just saying that so they can give the top players what they want. But then as it sank in and I tried to have a little bit more of an open mind about it, I started to sense some like, ah, there's some some merit to some of these things they're saying. And I'll get into the details of what it was they were saying. But essentially, when we got to, so by the time I got there for the policy board meeting on Tuesday, I'm still like adamant that I'm going to represent the the middle and bottom thirds of the PGA tour membership. That that's, that's my job in that room is to remember. So, so to me, that still means I've got to protect playing opportunities. I've got to fight for, you know, these, uh, these fields to be bigger, I've got to fight for them to be, you know, you know, full fields, close to full fields, you know, more, more playing opportunities. And then as we get in the room, um, the tour head was able between the time of our, um, our ops committee meeting and the policy board meeting, they'd been able to, to create some visual graphics of of the data that they've been able to to create through uh through some simulations that they've run and it was really really clear that um the way to protect the middle third and the bottom third of the pga tour membership is to move forward with this model that um that has small fields uh in the in the designated events explain why because that that's sort of counterintuitive. I, I want that's a really key point here. Explain that. So hard for me to to wrap my head around. It took a week. So so that's what I actually I've written a note that I've sent out to 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 a lot of my peers on the tour. A lot of people who were who were, in all honesty, somewhat counting on me. I think to go in and not let this happen. Um, so I've written this note because you're right. Incredibly counterintuitive. Incredibly hard to wrap my head around. And I told them in this note that I wrote that it took me a week. It took me a week of simmering on this for it to kind of settle down and make sense. So I don't expect them to be okay with it in a day. Um, but, but the nuts and bolts of it is this, um, you know, the events that the events that the majority of the tour can count on to play every year. Um, that's not to say that they are, you know, lesser events, but you know, if we look, you know, if you look on the West coast, you've got the Amex tournament, which uses multiple courses, farmer's insurance uses multiple courses. So those are big fields. Um, yeah, Pebble. yeah, we we go to yeah Pebbles, multiple courses, big field, um, and then you know, you move move west or move east, sorry, to Florida, and you've got you know the the Honda Classic, which will you know still exist with a new sponsor moving forward, and then Valspar um, in Tampa, which um, is you know a great, amazing golf course, but but you know a bigger field kind of falls right around a couple of big events, so it doesn't always get super marquee names. So, but all these events, you know, and you go all the way take that through the summer. And I, I made this little analogy today in my head too, where like, you know, there's all these, all these people who are like, like me, have been on tour for several years, have never made it to superstar status, you know, never, never, never sniffed a tour championship, but also have kept their card for several years. Um, and so I called them like, those are the Peter Malnati's of the tour. And then with our tournaments, you have all these tournaments that are the, the John Deere classics of the PGA tour schedule that are, absolutely amazing events that may not always get or may never get the top talent. Like, like if, if you look at the John Deere classic, I think it gets one to two of the top 50 players in the world. Most, most summers yet, if you look at what it does, it, it gives like, I think the last several summers it's given more than $10 million back into the Moline community and to, to charities in the Moline community. And, and it's a well attended event. It's a loved event by that community. It's a loved event by players on tour. Um, so the reason that this new model works for every single member of the PGA Tour and helps every single member of the PGA Tour is 
if we had 120 guys playing eight designated events, that's that takes not only the top tier of players out of the full field FedEx Cup events, it takes a lot of the middle tier out as well. Because if they know they're in Memorial, if they know they're in you know, whatever events they're going to, we don't know for sure what events they're going to elevate. We can count on the player hosts invitationals, I think being, being elevated. But if, if, if the top tier and middle tier know that they're in these designated events, they're going to skip, um, you know, they're going to skip all these events in, in the middle of the schedule. They're going to skip the, the Hunt classics, the, the Valspars, the, the John Deere's, the, they're going to skip them. And, and those events won't be able to sustain the level that they've come to, to, to know if, if, whether it's a purse level going back to the players or a community impact level that they have in the, the towns where they are. But under this model, and, and there's so much about this model that's good actually, because um, there's always going to be play and opportunities to get into the designated events always. And the, um, the full field regular FedEx cup events are all going to serve as a qualifying way to get into the designated events. Um, we're going to see, you know, I, I, a couple names that I could pick out. If I looked at our, I guess this season is so, so, so early. But if I look at our, our season and just take where it is right now, you know, imagine that we're a year ahead. We're in 2024, but we've got the FedEx Cup list that we have currently right now. Um, you would have guys, you know, you would have guys like, um, you know, Billy Horschel's and, and uh, Gary Woodland's and guys that, that fans love fans know fans root for that need to play these events, these full field, regular FedEx cup events, because they might not necessarily be in a smaller field designated event. And so they're going to play and it's going to make those events easier to sell the sponsors, easier to sell the media partners. Those events are going to be able to not only sustain the level they're at, I think they will truly be able to grow. And there's really wise people on the policy board that agreed with that, like that thought that they could realistically see growth for those events, even though they're living in a world now that consists of eight of these designated or elevated events. I think we can realistically strengthen every event on the PGA Tour under this model. And I don't think we could if we had the larger fields that I originally fought so hard for. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you think it's that middle tier of players that are going to support the lesser tournaments on tour and they're going to be difference makers, but I still think it's a star driven enterprise. And by, by kind of codifying that there's these two different tours in some ways, the John Deere's and the, the Bob hopes and some of those are, are they ever going to get top players? And if, if they don't get the top 20 or 30 guys, can, can they really survive as, as, as the, the tour becomes more bifurcated? I think one thing that the tour is getting so right here that I didn't give them any credit for it is this. Um, a smaller field also means it's hard to be in those designated events. So if you look like, like a superstar has a couple of meanings on tour. Like the superstar is the person who's playing great right now. And obviously the top 10 in the world, you know, like, like Scotty Scheffler, absolutely a superstar. But, but in terms of our fan base, like, uh, Ricky Fowler's having a great year right now, so he 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 is he's a uh, he's back up to a level. But but for the last several years, Ricky would not be in these designated events, and you can't call him anything other than a superstar. And if you look at like um, you know a Fran Molinari, Fran Molinari is an absolute superstar in the game, but he hasn't played well for a couple years, so he is not going to be in these designated events, and he's going to need and want to get in them. Like that's what we're all going to strive for. So this year the schedule sucks. And we all know that like, like the tour knows that every single constituent group knows that like, you know, the Honda classic being sandwiched, designated, designated Honda, designated players. Terrible. No one wanted that. Um, It was a trans, it's a transition year. It's tough. The thing that got me to open my mind in the first place was looking at the cadence of the schedule for 2024. It's beautiful. I, I, I truly think, that even even the Rory McIlroy's and I mean they're going to have to play some of the full field events because they can't like that's another good thing the tour got right is the number of these designated events like there's not too many they don't dominate the schedule, um, but the full field regular FedEx Cup events, some of the top guys they're they're going to pick one out of the three at pretty much every time I think to play, um, you know because there's it, like I said the, the the schedule has a beautiful flow it goes like designated event 
full field, full field, full field, designated, designated, full field, full field, designated players, full field, full field. So there's always two and a lot of times three full field events between designated events. And so I think even the top players will, will most of those blocks pick one of the full field events to play, especially when they're in blocks of three. Um, and so that helps. And then like I, like I was saying before, I just think, you know, there are several names in this middle group of tour players who have great, great, great name, name recognition with fans and, and are easy sells for, for title sponsors who are like, Oh yeah, you know, we're going to get Gary Woodland this year. We're going to get Ricky Fowler this year. We're going to get, you know, whoever the case may be that maybe didn't have their best, best play because honestly at a, at a number as small as 70, these designated events are going to be hard to get in. And, you know, I, another thing, I, I, I just really, I truly believe that the, the strength of the entire schedule will be improved by this, which I, I, I that's a 180 for me. I, I must admit that. That's a 180 for me. A week ago, I thought small field no cuts were just horrible for the tour's model and for the middle and bottom of the membership. And I have, I haven't nudged myself toward thinking it's okay. I'm flipped to where I think this is a really good idea. Well, let, let's talk about the no cut. Cause this has been a flashpoint and obviously hovering over all of this is live golf. And, you know, I thought the, the strongest talking point the tour had is that, that we are hardcore competition and live is, is more of an exhibition and they don't have to earn it out there. And now all of a sudden the tour has gone to smaller fields, no cut guaranteed money. This, this feeling by some people, it's a closed shop, even though there, there can be some turnover, but once you're in these elevated events, it's going to help you stay in the elevated events. So do you worry that, that a fundamental component of the PGA tour is being lost that, that need to make the cut to earn your spot and, and to prove it. And at the same time, also delineate yourself from the competition. Like a lot of people are upset about losing the cuts, especially in the most important events. So what is your response to that? I, I worry about that a lot. I, I, that, that is something, um, you know, from as far down as you know, I get to, um, I'm, I'm really lucky. I live, I live near the university of Tennessee. They have a wonderful practice facility for their golf teams. And so I, I mentor some of the kids on that team who are really, really good. And, and, you know, they'll ask me a lot, you know, you know, what's the biggest step? What do I need to do? How do I, and I always tell them, I was like, in a college tournament, you know, if you play lousy the first two days and you go play great the third day, you still help your team. You still feel good. It's all good. Pro tournament, you play lousy the first two days. You just spent, you know, on a mini tour, you probably spent 1500 to 2000 bucks on a PJ tour. You've spent, you know, four to 8,000 bucks and you don't, you don't get anything. You go home, like you're done. And, and that's, that sucks. And that's a real thing in professional golf. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I've thrown this in the commissioner's face a lot of times that the first week Liv played, it was, you know, I don't even know where they played, somewhere in London or something. London, yeah. uh, we were at the RBC Canadian Open and the commissioner went on CBS in the Sunday broadcast and he said, what we do at the PGA Tour is true and pure competition. And I've, I've, I've thrown that line at him incessantly over the last months because I'm like, we can't, we can't have no cut events and say we do true and pure competition. That's just, blah, blah. and I, I, I've been, I've been adamant about that. And so I'll tell you why I'm, why I'm at peace with this new model. Um, and it's, it's the fact that I'll tell you the difference between, between us and, and whatever I'm supposed to call them live. Um, the difference is live guys were handpicked, not always based, based sometimes on popularity, not based on, on recent results or anything like that. They were handpicked to play in a field where they're guaranteed to make a lot of money. These, um, these designated events will have nobody that was handpicked. They're going to have, um, there, there will be, there will be sponsors exemptions Maximum of four, I think. I don't know if I'm even I, maximum of four for sure. But but they're not going to be. They're going to be restricted to. There's going to. We haven't hammered out all the details. They're going to be restricted to either life members, which is Tiger, you know, or 
people who are in form right now. Like um, they're not going to be able to just, you know, the tournaments aren't going to be able to say, oh yeah, well we sponsor this guy. So we want him in. It's got to be someone who is, you know, whether, whether the with some crew criteria we talked about was top hundred in the world currently for a sponsor's invite or um, multiple wins on the PGA tour in the last five years. Um, so, something along those lines, there will be nobody in a designated event who is being handed a spot and being handed, you know, whether it's last place money or anything like every person in those fields has played well to qualify for them. And it's either he played incredibly well the last season consistently over an entire season. And so that got you in or you're hot right now and you've played really well in the, you know, the weeks or months leading up to this designated event to get in them. So the players who play in a designated event have earned the right to be there with their scores on the course and nothing else. Um, and so that, that is a big difference. That is still a gray area for me. I, I, I've even pitched the idea, which, you know, we're not going to do this in year one for sure. I don't know that we will ever do it, but I've even pitched the idea of embracing the small field, but embrace a smaller cut. Like, you know, we could have a 75 player field cut to top 40 in ties on after the first two days. That's possible. And I think that would achieve everything that we've talked about wanting to do. Um, but certainly not going to do that in year one. Um, but the cut, the cut is massively important. I'm at peace with this plan. I can sell this plan to the membership because of the fact that you have to earn your right to be in a designated event. There are no spots handed out to anyone in them. What has been the reaction from your, your peers in the last 24 to 36 hours as, as the details have leaked out? Yeah. I mean, yeah, predictable. Like I, wh- where was I, where was I seven days ago? I was, I was adamant that no, no cut, small field, no cut events were, were just a cop out and a horrible path forward for the PGA tour. So when, when my peers learn that they feel the same way. Um, I will say um, the tour did a, the tour did a really, 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 um, good job of actually giving us, we asked for an ops, ops committee. I'm not, I'm not on Island. Like, like Rory is an incredibly thoughtful leader. I, and quite appreciate him. Obviously he's been a superstar in golf since he was a teenager. Um, so his perspective will be different than mine, but he is a thoughtful guy. I appreciate him. Um, Charlie Hoffman and Webb Simpson, um, are particularly um, attuned to the voice of the entire membership. So it's not like I'm on a, on, on an Island, like the only one in there fighting, fighting for this, but, but I was, I was particularly impressed with the tour um, in the data that they were able to give us, you know, they, they, they have a, I don't know how it works. Um, I'm pretty ignorant as to the details of, of the, the technology, but they were able to run simulated a thousand simulated seasons under the projected plan that we've put forward. Um, and, and, you know, the results in these thousand simulated seasons were actually really impressive to see, you know, what percentage of players playing in the, the full field events came from the top 125 from the previous year category or higher versus what percentage came from, you know, the corn fairy tour category or below. And if we did 120 player fields, it was not a good ratio. Like the, the, there were only, you know, the average event was only going to have, I'm going to butcher the number, but approximately like 30 to 35% of the field of in a full field event would be from 125 the previous year or above. And the rest would be, you know, um, the corn fairy category. And then below that, um, whereas at small field for these events, it was significantly more than 50% of the fields being filled by top 125 and above category. Um, and so to see that, to see that data, um, you know, really, really, really swayed and influenced me. Um, and the other thing I'll say, um, if I may, without you even asking, um, <laughs> the other thing that, that was incredibly important to me, I, I, I remember, I remember a conversation I had with Maverick McNeely. Um, Maverick is a very, very smart, um, smart leader on the tour and obviously a great player too, but Maverick and I talked about the ideas that were being sort of rumored, um, coming out of the Delaware meeting and Maverick, you know, smart uses big words. He said, it's okay. It's okay to create. He's, I think it's okay to create a stratified tour where you have like, you know, a higher tier of events and a lower tier of events. 
the problem is if you have stratification with no mobility, you have to have mobility. And when he said that, I was like, because I wasn't really okay with the stratified tour at that point. I was just like, you know, I, I liked the idea of, you know, all of us playing together all the time and whatever. I just thought, you know, I, I, I didn't want it to be, I didn't want anyone to tell me it was going to be harder for me to play in the Memorial because I like the Memorial. Darn it. Um, but this new model, like the, another thing they were able to do with that, those thousand simulated seasons, um, what it revealed was that um, there was 64% retention within the top 50 from one year to the next, which means 36% turnover, which means 18 guys in and 18 guys out. Um, that's pretty good mobility, honestly. If you think about what, like, you know, if you're handing the top 50, eight no-cut events with higher concentration of FedEx Cup points to the top 10, the fact that there's 18 guys that, you know, on an, in an average season, you know, some seasons more, some seasons a few less, but always centered right around 18 guys, that's a pretty good amount of mobility. I, I, I was, I was very worried when this was, pre, when this was um, presented that we would have, you know, eight or 10 guys able to move in and out of the top 50. So if, if 18 is the average, that, that actually, that, that to me, that says to, to me and to the other, you know, the other 130 Peter Malnati's of the PGA tour, go work your ass off. Like go, 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 go get good. Like go do it because you can, this is not closed. Like it's tight, it's small, but it's not closed. So go. And, and I, I really, I left the pack meet or the, uh, the board meeting, like proud of the fact that I had had an open enough mind to see this. And, excited about the future but as much as anything motivated to go be a part of it like that was i it it didn't it didn't feel like a closed shop to me and and the data really proves that it's not or reveals that it's not so i'm super excited it's a rallying cry for this chaotic era uh <laughs> stratification with mobility <laughs> like <laughs> i love it um did you see some of the chortling from the live golf guys on social media and otherwise basically saying, Hey, thanks for stealing our idea. Uh, how did that land with you? I didn't see anything. I don't see anything. I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny. It was out there. I'll put it, put it that way. There, uh, well, you know, I mean, it, that, that's predictable, obviously. Um, yeah, very predictable. I, uh, I had my, uh, my first, my son was born in October of 2019 and, you know, I mean, I was, I never had a, a huge Twitter following or anything of it. I was never, I was never very good on Twitter. Um, I'm no Max Homa, you know, I'm no Max Homa, I'm no Joel Damon. Um, I, <laughs> um, but, you know, I just, I, I decided when my son was born, I was like, you know what? It may make me less valuable. It may make my, 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 may hurt my brand. I don't have a brand. I don't really care. Um, I, I, I deleted all my social media and, I am, I am happier. I am wiser. I am more sane for doing so. Like I really, you know, I really feel, I really feel a greater sense of peace, not always knowing what's going on. Um, obviously I don't need to be on social media to know what the response is to what we're doing is it's, it's, I mean, it, it is a hard time. Like ideally I would not have ever chosen to have events on tour with no cut. I just don't think that's, I, I, I think cuts are essential to, competition at the highest level in professional golf but given where we are i think this model that we just proposed is damn good and i think it's going to really 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 help the entire pga tour from top to bottom it's i i, I ran for the board on the message that i'm going to fight for the middle and lower tiers of the pga tour and in a very strange and ironic way i just did that like i just did and and that's i didn't think that going in but it takes, uh, you know, we always, I, I, it's cool. I got to meet, um, one of the new, uh, I, I have a fellow rookie on the PJ tour policy board named Jimmy Dunn and Jimmy, um, Jimmy said to me yesterday something, cause I, I, I told him, I told him what my thoughts were going into this. I, I explained to him, you know, where and why, and you know, he was really, you know, I think he saw merit in my concerns too. And then at the end of the meeting, he said to me, he said, you know what? You can't be sure of something unless you doubted it first. And, and 
I don't really know if that's just one of those things you hang on a wall or if there's actually some truth in that. But I really like, I, I, I really feel really confident that, that the decisions that came out of this meeting yesterday are going to make the PGA tour stronger, way more marketable. And honestly, for every single member from top to bottom, we're going to have more high quality playing opportunities. And that's, that's what I went in there to fight for. And I, in a way that I didn't expect, I think we came out with, with that result. Well, a sign of intelligence is that you're willing to change your mind when confronted with new information. So I salute your ability to, to change course. Cause that's not easy to do. That takes a certain humility, um, and an open-mindedness that a lot of us don't have. So, I mean, that, that, that's impressive. Uh, Another sign of intelligence is deleting social media. So Peter Malnati, possibly the smartest man in golf we've established on this podcast. Uh, I will I will tell the listeners that uh, I promised Peter we'd keep this short because it's almost 9 o'clock in Orlando. He, he wants to put his son to bed. And, oh, by the way, you've got a little golf tournament to play in Bay Hill tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, we're going to let you go, Peter. You've been quite a sport and a gent. So thank you for doing this. I, I think your, your thoughts are valuable to the golf fans out there who are trying to make sense of this changing landscape. So, so thank you for the time. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I, I'll leave them with one message. It's, it's, this is hard cause this is big change and this isn't what, um, this isn't what I, this isn't what I wanted to see come out of this. But now that I know the, I know the details and I know how, how this change will affect the PGA tour, it's going to make, um, it's going to make, the the designated events obviously will have you know close close to a hundred percent attendance from the top fifty players in the world. You know we'll miss a few, but but close to hundred percent attendance. So they're going to be they're going to be a spectacle. You know eight times throughout the season we're going to have that in addition to the majors. What this is really really going to do is you know last week for for fans that watched uh, um, Chris Kirk and Eric Cole battle it out down the stretch. Those two guys are both battling out in the stretch, and the winner is going to be exempt into the designated events for the rest of the season. And the guy that finishes second is certainly going to accrue enough points during that swing to be in the next designated event. And these events are going to be big enough and fun enough and 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 cool enough that there's actually going to be cool storylines from the events in between. So the tour, the tour got more compelling yesterday, and it honestly, it really didn't even get. I, I was worried that it was going to get less fair. It didn't. It, it got more compelling, more interesting. And yeah, it's going to be harder for the Peter Malnage at the tour to be in these designated events moving forward. But if I play well enough, I'll be there. And so will Eric Cole. And so will Joel Damon. And so will, you know, the rookie who just got his card. Like if they play well enough, they can be in these designated events. And so that's, that system is, is, you know, shockingly to me, it's going to be amazing. And so let's go. Let's be ready for it. I love it. All right. Well, again, thank you for your time. Uh, that was Peter Malnati. This is Alan Shipnock. This is another Fire Drill podcast. And uh, we will keep bringing you the breaking news of the golf world, which is fast and furious these days. So <laughs> uh, thanks, Peter, for his time. And thanks for listening. That's the end. I got thoughts in my head. I'm trying not to think what I'm thinking about I got thoughts in my head, can't get them out Trying not to think